Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm really grateful to Ricardo Selva for the invitation to present this tutorial. And um, I'm extremely sorry that I can't be there in person. We tried hard, but uh, we couldn't get the visa in time. Uh, so today, me and uh, Hussein Soleimani, whom you will see shortly, we're going to do a tutorial on bringing together ideas from machine learning and causal inference on the topic of doing personalized decision making. Now, more and more data are getting collected on the internet, in healthcare, as you visit the doctor's clinic, in classrooms, in order to be able to develop a more personalized uh, experience of your daily life. Uh, in today's talk, I'll focus on new methods for personalization that are broadly applicable um, in other domains like education, recommended systems, retail, but really re the fo core focus is going to be on medicine. The examples are going to be on medicine. We've thought hard about what are ideas in medicine uh, and how to tailor these uh, techniques and tools to make it work in medicine. And uh, you know, when Ricardo sent that invitation, he wanted me to talk broadly about the use of machine learning in healthcare, which seemed, uh, you know, there's a lot of different topics to cover. Um, we've really focused this particular talk on, rather than being a broad survey, focusing on a narrow set of ideas uh, that motivate, I think, one set of approaches that uh, at least I'm very excited about. This is obviously a biased point of view. And um, rather than giving you, you know, being able to deeply work through the derivation and details of every idea, uh, the style of the presentation is going to be, you know, giving you key pointers with papers and the high-level ideas that allow you to stitch sort of the approach together. All right. So just as an introduction for those of you especially who don't work in medicine at all, but um, it'll seem broadly relevant in other areas too, how do we currently make decisions about, you know, whom to treat, what to treat with, and a large body of that knowledge comes out of clinical trials. So effectively, based on a core set of characteristics, a population is defined. So for instance, maybe adults greater than the age of 65, uh, you know, female, for instance. And then interventions are defined A versus B. You randomize people onto the A arm versus the B arm. And based upon that, effectively, you see if the particular protocol was effective. And if it was effective, it becomes a recommendation. So now, we're going to refer to these as population-based models. Why? Because it does not capture in great granularity much individual-specific variability. And here's a very simple example, like managing blood pressure in adults. And you know, you'll have a collection of you know, chronic disease they might have or specific treatments they may or may not be on that you can exclude them. So for instance, very often it is the protocol in these kinds of trials to exclude people that are complicated. What we mean by this is people with multiple chronic conditions, people who are on medications with strong side effects, people on medications that might interact with the protocol. But in reality, when you actually want to make decision, when a clinician is trying to make a decision for any person that's in front of them, they don't have the option to exclude. They will have to make decision for every patient that walks in front of them. And the question that we want to then think about is, as more and more data are getting collected, large amounts of deep granular data are getting collected in uh, digital repositories like electronic health records, can we do better? Because these clinical trials are very coarse. They, they contain uh, you know, recommendations based on just two, three, four attributes. And it, it should be possible, as you collect a lot of data on this individual and lots of other individuals, in order to be able to develop recommendations that are far more tailored. So let me give you an example. Scleroderma. Here's a disease. It's a systemic disease. It's an autoimmune disease. Systemic means it affects many different organ systems, skin, lung, kidney, intestines, vasculature. And the way it affects individuals varies a great deal. Some experience the disease entirely in the skin, others in the lung, others in the kidney. And so this notion of like what is the classic protocol for treatment, treating scleroderma is you know, a, not a question, Can, you know, clinicians naturally think about variability and naturally think about the question of what is the right, uh, you know, treatment protocol for this person. And scleroderma is not sort of a very special disease. There are at least 80 other autoimmune diseases that fall in this, this class of diseases. Many of them have the same challenge. So continuing down the example 
here's an example patient, real patient, for whom I'm showing you data. And here I'm, it's a chronic disease. I'm showing you data on the x-axis, it's 15 years. And on the y-axis, what I have is the marker value. And skin marker value is one type of marker, what it measures is skin thickness. And what the skin thickness, uh, so in scleroderma, you get fibrotic, your skin thickens over time, and the greater the thickness, the sicker you are, right? And so every visit, what you're seeing is a marker value that's collected, that's a dot, and that's collected over time. And now this gives you the ability to track an individual, and skin is one such marker. You have a collection of such markers, and I'm showing you a few examples there. Um, and you collect that not just on an individual, but a large population of individuals. OK, so let me give you a concrete example for scleroderma, the kinds of decisions clinicians have to make. So here's a patient. Question is, you know, you've observed, they've received some drugs, you've also seen values of certain markers that you've collected over time. Now you're standing a point in time there and asking at you know year five, uh, given what I've seen thus far, how should I choose a treatment plan going forward? Right? So one example concrete thing is they're trying to figure out which immunosuppressant to administer. And different immunosuppressants um, have side effects to different extents and also you're trading off efficacy versus uh, the degree of uh, side effects this patient can handle. So ideally what you would love to do is something like this. If I could simulate a trial on this individual, right? what that means is if I could take this person, give them the immunosuppressant A, see what happens, then I give them B, see what happens, then I give them, perhaps even I might have decisions to make about how many doses of A or B to give, so I give that, and I do this multiple times, and each time I get to observe what happens, from this, I can effectively figure out what would be the right strategy. And this, loosely, we will refer to as the task of estimating the course under different scenarios, right? So our goal here is we're basically, for this individual, trying to guess or estimate what is this person's course going to look like, our outcome going to look like under different scenarios, and what we mean by the counterfactual. And the reason it's the counterfactual is because it's um, the outcome under interventions where you don't necessarily get to observe what the outcome would have been and you have to estimate it. Okay, so here's the broad outline of the talk. So we'll start by motivating why we want to think about an approach of this kind. Um, and so I'll start by giving some examples where naive application of off-the-shelf predictive methods uh, produce answers that are counterintuitive. Next, um, we'll give a little bit of background on kind of actual reasoning for personalization. So we'll introduce the potential outcomes framework, which is one way of uh, doing kind of actual reasoning. We'll talk about uh, SWIGS, which is a graphical representation for representing kind of actual graphs. Then we give a brief introduction on Gaussian processes, which is a framework we will use for modeling the potential outcomes because electronic health record data are highly noisy. Um, and we sort of show why thinking of it using um, GPs are useful. And then finally, we'll set up a framework to, uh, and show examples of using this framework in electronic health record data for a variety of different applications. OK, so let me start with a concrete example of why off-the-shelf application of predictive methods um, are problematic. So in this example, what I'm showing you is a patient on whom you have tons of data that's being tracked, this is in the hospital setting, you want to be able to predict an adverse event, right? So an adverse event could be something like a cardiac arrest or a shock event. Um, and the question, so one natural way of tra tackling this, and there are hundreds and thousands of papers that do things like this, is you, know, you take the data, you compute, take a window, streaming window of sorts, you compute a bunch of features, and now you treat this as a classical regression problem where you basically have labels, and your label here might be perhaps does this person have an adverse event in the next 24 hours or not, or in the next 48 hours or not. And uh, you're effectively training some kind of supervised learning algorithm or regression function. You put in the features, you put in your label, and you're trying to predict whether or not the event will occur. Here's what you would do. You would basically using, use some kind of a windowing approach. You're effectively computing features you turn into a supervised learning problem or a regression problem where you have a label. So this label might be 24 or 48 hours later, seeing in the next 24 to 48 hour window, does this person have an adverse event? And now you're using a sliding window to create many such examples and learn features that are predictive 
of the event happening in the say 24 to 48 hour window. Now, numerous scores are created with this type of an approach. The pneumonia severity index published in the New England Journal of Medicine, very commonly used, is also an example of this. Now, the uh, issue here is the following. Between when you use the window to forecast and the actual annotation, lots of other events have happened in the interim. And the issue is what types of events occur are dependent upon what the providers did. And what I'll shortly show you is that effectively this kind of an approach is very susceptible. The resulting predictive modeling algorithm you learn or the resulting predictive score you learn is highly susceptible to the um, practice patterns of the providers. So if you change the environment where providers practice differently, the score will no longer generalize. Okay, so let's do a quick concrete example. Let's imagine uh, you have two measurements you're tracking, temperature and white blood cell count. If the temperature goes up, it indicates rise of flu. If it goes up uncontrolled, this person dies. Similarly, if the WBC goes up, it again indicates rise of flu. Uh, if it goes uncontrolled, the patient dies, okay? So basically, either increase in temperature or WBC, as shown in the graph, is associated with risk of death. Now, in the simulation example, what I'm going to do is create different units or scenarios, right? Different hospitals where people have different provider practice pattern. And these practice patterns, I'm going to do a very simple Markov chain where patients progress until treated, and all I'm varying is the type of treatment policy I'm using. So in one scenario, I might give them treatment based upon, you know, high temperature means providers start notice that and start treating right away. In another scenario, they tend to ignore temperature and they notice uh, WBCs, high WBCs, and they start treating right away. So here in this table, I'm showing you five different scenarios. Uh, the, first, the second and third columns are train, the fourth and fifth columns are test. And effectively, as we go from top to bottom, I'm generating scenarios where there's more and more drift from my training to my test scenario. And in particular, the drift is of the following form. In scenarios four and five, I am eager to train using, I'm eager to treat using temperature, but in my test scenario, I tend to not treat based on temperature, I tend to treat based on WBC. So this is effectively an, a version of you developing a diagnostic device in one hospital, and now you're moving to a different hospital where providers have slightly different treatment patterns. Or you even staying within a hospital where in one regime where providers tend to practice one way, and now you know perhaps there's a different set of providers that are being, that are treating, or different unit or practices have changed, and so you're looking at a second regime where people are treating slightly differently. And now I'm going to use the same supervised learning algorithm I just spoke to you about, train it in the train and data generated from the training scenario and evaluate it in the test scenario. And what I'm showing you here is effectively, and you know, I use logistic regression, you could use a really fancy, um, you know, more flexible uh, method for doing regression or classification, but you know that's not going to change the conclusion here. And the conclusion here is, as your training and test scenarios diverge, not so surprisingly, uh, basically, and in particular practice patterns diverge, effectively you start to see that uh, you know the performance of the um, algorithm in detecting risk also diverges. So the question is why? And so very simply, when you're learning in a scenario where effectively um, training is from data where providers tend to actively treat against high temperature, you're seeing fewer and fewer examples of people where high temperatures associate with death. As a result, what you end up learning is that high temperature is not associated with high risk of death. Why? Because you're learning what the risk is conditioned on provider practice patterns, and the provider practice pattern here is that they're very, go they're very good at finding people on whom they end up getting high temperature and getting treated, right? And that graph here is showing you, as I increase the, um, as I increase the, um, change the policy to increase the propensity with which providers treat based on increasing temperature, my curve for risk association with death falls and gets closer and closer to zero, okay? So effectively, what we're learning is risk scores that are highly sensitive to provider practice patterns. And in this particular example, it is problematic that it learns 
something that ought to be high risk is not high risk, right? It, it only is in high risk because providers happen to treat for it. Um, there's another really nice example by Caruana uh, where he brings up this notion of um, you know, patients with pneumonia with a history of asthma are generally more uh, likely to die or have a, a high association risk of death. But uh, when we sort of apply naively predictive modeling algorithms, what we learn is indeed they don't. So patients, pneumonia patients with um, asthma history actually have lower risk. And part of the reason is because these patients are the ones that end up going to the ICU more often. And in the ICU, which is a critical care unit, you get a higher level of care, you get more intensive care. And so as a result, you actually tend to get better. So another example of why you know, thinking harder about how to account for um, practice patterns are important. OK, so in machine learning terms, if you had to see this idea, one way to think about this is, and I'm showing you an example on top, where you have your predictive window, you have your label, and there are interventions in the middle. And one way to think about this is basically the interventions in the middle are corrupting your label, right? Effectively, you don't have a pure label. You have a corrupted label. You have a noisy label or a censored label. So in the cases where you end up getting treated um, in the middle, effectively, you're not getting the label. And let's imagine you got treated and you never experienced the outcome of death. It's not because you wouldn't have died if you had been left untreated. It's that uh, we're not seeing the true outcome. The true outcome here meaning what would have happened had I done nothing to you. Okay. So one way, and I think an interesting and exciting way to go is to start thinking about better ways to build models that account for these types of corruptions. Okay. A different way of thinking about it is instead of using this downstream label, I could have collected a different type of supervision, which is gotten a provider to give me the severity score at the time at which I was trying to score them, it's, uh, score the uh, um, data itself. So in this example, you know, the window, the purple window, and I'm trying to assess risk, if I could go to the provider and just say, can you just tell me what you believe the risk is? Obviously, this is not a scalable approach because trying to get the provider to give you the risk may be, non, may be not very easy. Um, and so it doesn't really generalize. There are other kinds of approaches one can use. Uh, Jagada et al. proposed one. But today's talk, we're going to focus on the idea of joint modeling of the, both the, um, the marker data and the action data and bring ideas from causal inference in order to do counterfactual reasoning. OK, so to summarize, um, when we're applying the standard supervised learning approach, where we have our label and our marker data and our learning associations, one of the, you know, one way to think about this is it's learning who are the individuals at risk, condition upon providers keeping the practice pattern the same as the environment where you train the model. Okay? But the thing you really want to know is who is the person at risk if I had done nothing? In other words, what is likely to happen to this patient given the history if we treat versus do not treat, right? And you want to be able to rank patients based on risk had you not treated. And all the individuals previously that you had treated would now effective, you know, that doctors were routinely treating would now start becoming high risk. And the algorithm would correctly account for the fact that the reason they were low risk is because the um, because they were treated, not because the markers um, that cause the doctors to treat are indeed markers of low risk. OK. And now in order to be able to ask this question of what would have likely happened if I were to treat versus not treat, this is a question that we will answer using um, kind of actual reasoning. All right, with that, uh, Hussein will present the next section that will give a brief background on kind of actual reasoning and potential outcomes. <laughs> Hi, everyone. So in the last section, we saw that using off-the-shelf machine learning methods for clinical data could be problematic. And we saw that why we needed causal predictions. So in this section, we are just going to go over counterfactual reasoning. We are going to set up the potential outcome framework and talk about SUIX. So, <clears throat> so let's begin with a simple example, which we are going to use throughout this section to, to, to motivate examples and to, to describe different concepts. So let's imagine that we hypothesize that exercise could lower blood pressure. 
Now, the question that we want to answer is that can we take an existing data set and test this hypothesis and estimate the effect that exercise could have on blood pressure? So one natural question that one could ask is that can we just get any data set, observational data, and a data set that has people who do exercise and, and those who don't, and then can we just take average of blood pressure for people who do exercise separately and for those who don't, and then compare these averages, would that be the causal effect of exercise on blood pressure? So the short answer to this question is that not in general. So let's begin with an example, simple example, where actually this simple idea would work. So here we are assuming a, a graphical model where we are assuming that blood pressure for a person depends on that, that person's BMI and also depends on whether or not that, patient, that person exercises. So we are assuming that whether or not a person exercises does not depend on any other factor. It's just drawn from a Bernoulli distribution with probability a half. And also we are assuming that there is a 0.8 causal effect of exercise on, on blood pressure, meaning that at any given BMI level, if a person does exercise, its blood pressure would, would decrease by 0.8. So now we're going to generate data from this graphical model. And we're going to take average blood pressure of people who do exercise and average of blood pressure for those who don't. And then when we look at, when we compare, take the difference between these two averages, we see that the causal effect, that the effect that we estimate is 0.79, which is pretty close to the actual causal effect. So we see that in this simple example, this, this our intuitive simple approach does actually work. And the reason that it does work is that we've assumed that the, whether or not a person does exercise does not depend on any other factor. And it's just basically a 50% probability that any person could, could be assigned to, do, to exercise or not exercise. Now let's move to a slightly more complicated example where now whether or not a person is asked to exercise depends on its BMI level. So we are assuming that if a person has higher BMI, it's more likely to be assigned to the exercise group. And so we adjust our graphical model to, to account for this fact. And so, so we generate data from that graphical model. And now we, we look at the average difference of averages. And now this time, it turns out that it doesn't work. Looking at the average of blood pressure for people who do and don't exercise do not work. And the reason is that this time, unlike the first example that we saw, that whether or not a person exercises depends on that person's BMI. And so there's essentially a, a selection bias. So the, the question is now, how can we adjust for this bias? So one approach for doing this is what's called weighting. So, so the intuitive idea here is that when we take these averages, we want to count some people who are sort of underrepresented in our population. We want to count them more. So what, does, what it means is that, for example, there are people with low BMI who were just randomly assigned, based on that distribution, were assigned to be to, were asked to do exercise. And for example, other, there are other patients with high BMI who were asked to not exercise. These are people who we do not expect to see very frequently in, the, in our population. So we want to count these people more, assign higher weights to these people. So how, the way it works is that we, we just compute the probability of assigning a treatment, in this case exercise, to have, to each, for each person. And then we take the inverse of that probability as the weight for that individual. So this slide is just, we're just formalizing that idea a little bit more. So omega i is just that inverse of that probability of assigning a treatment. And now what's, what's important here is just we are assuming that we, we either know this distribution of treatment, assigning treatments, or we can estimate it. And the other issue is that this, this method could have very high variance. So <clears throat> an alternative approach for, for doing this is what's called the potential outcomes framework, which is the approach that we are going to take in this talk. So <clears throat> to understand this framework, let's Let's, again, going back to our simple example, let's think for each individual, let's conceptualize two alternative realities. One where, under, under one reality where the person does exercise, 
and under an alternative reality where the person doesn't exercise. Now, we, we call the blood pressure for, for that person under each one of these realities a potential outcome. <coughs> now, of course, in practice, we don't get to observe both of these realities. We only observe one of them. But let's, for now, imagine that we can somehow estimate these two potential outcomes. If we can estimate that, then computing this causal effect is very simple, because all we have to do is to look at the difference for each individual, look at the difference between these two potential outcomes and then take average over entire population. So let's, to just formalize this idea a little bit more, we are going to define two different random variables, y of a and y of b. y of a here is the blood pressure with exercise, and y of b, blood pressure without exercise. Now, I want to emphasize here what, what this notation means. y of a, for example, does not mean blood pressure for people who, were, who just happened to be assigned to exercise. YFA means that blood pressure for people, if we get to ask them to exercise, and if we get to ask someone to do exercise, what would the blood pressure for that person look like? And similarly, YFP is if, 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 if we ask someone to, to don't exercise, what is the blood pressure for that person? And so more generally, if you have more than two alternative treatments, we can also index a set of random variables using a, a collection of actions and treatments. So now, the, for, the, for the rest of this section, we are going to talk about assumptions under which we can estimate these potential outcomes using observational data. <coughs> so it turns out that there are three assumptions that, if they hold, we can estimate potential outcomes from observational data. These assumptions are consistency, treatment positivity, and no unmeasured confounders. <coughs> so I'm going to talk about each one of these assumptions in the following slides. All right, so the first assumption is consistency. What it means is that if we get to observe blood pressure for some person who were assigned somehow based on some assignment strategy to, to do exercise, the blood pressure for that person would be the same if we get to ask that person to exercise. So a little more formally means that the potential outcome, y of a, would be equal to the observed y conditioned on, on the treatment. All right, so, so the second assumption is positivity. And what it says is that for any set of covariates, we need to assume that there is a non-zero probability of seeing each treatment. And what it means is that we can't, if, if there is not, if there is, if if, there is, if this assumption is not true, then we can't generalize and we can't learn the conditional model for those treatments. <clears throat> so for the third assumption is non-measured confounders. And what it says is that we have to observe all confounders. Now to understand what, what a confounder is, let's go back again to our simple blood pressure and exercise example. In that example, BMI was a confounder because it induces a statistical dependency between the observed treatment, which was whether or not a person exercised, and the observed outcome, which was the blood pressure. So what this assumption means is that in order to have an unbiased estimate of the potential outcomes, we have to observe all these confounders. And a little more technically, what it means is that condition on the covariates, the potential outcome should be independent of the treatment. <coughs> so. To make this last assumption a little more intuitive, we can look at what's called a single word intervention graph, or SWIG. So SWIGs are just extensions of graphical models that would allow us to explicitly represent potential outcomes. One key operation that we do on, <coughs> on SWIGs is, is called node splitting, which allows us to, to, to do this node splitting operation on treatment variables and which allows us to represent interventions. So let me give you one example. <clears throat> so on the left, we see a causal graphical model. We are assuming that there is only one treatment variable, A. There is one outcome, Y. And we are assuming that there is no confounders. So on the right, we are seeing two sui graphs built off of this causal graph. For example, on the top, we see a sui where we are doing A. We are we are applying a do operation and assigning treatment A. So we are doing node, node splitting on this treatment node A, and we are doing A, meaning that we are 
we are forcing this random variable to be a, and that would give gives rise to, to a potential outcome y of a. And similarly, we can do this for, for the alternative treatment, which is y of b. Now, <clears throat> what's, what's important here to say is that we can, we can treat swigs as just standard causal graphs. The only difference is that when we see these semicircle nodes, it's just a reminder for us that we have applied a node splitting operation. Otherwise, we can do any other operation that we do on standard graphs on these on SWIGs too. For example, we can look at SWIGs and, and figure out the conditional dependencies. For example, on this example graph here, we can see that Y of A is independent of the observed treatment big A. <coughs> so we can also use SWIGs to check the no unmeasured confounder assumption. Again, remember that we, we assume that condition on covariates, the potential outcome should be independent of observed treatment. So on the left, we see our causal graph with the treatment A, outcome Y, and con confounder X. If we do a node splitting operation on A, we see that if we condition on X, now Y of A is independent, is de-separated from big A. So, and that would tell us that this, the, the, the non-measured confounder, if we observe X, would hold in this graph. <coughs> so now that we know these assumptions, if all these assumptions hold, we can we are going to show that we can estimate potential outcomes from observational data. <coughs> to see how we can do this, let's look at this example distribution on the bottom of this slide. So on the left, we see the distribution of potential outcome condition on covariates. This is the thing that we want to estimate. So we're going to first use the third assumption, the no, no unmeasured confounders. And that would allow us to remember that assumption was that if we condition on x, Potential outcome is independent of, of the treatment. So we, I, can, I can insert back in A equal little a on the other side of, side of this distribution and get what, what's right on the, on the right side of this line. And then when, once we have this, we can, we can use the consistency assumption and then replace the potential outcome variable with, with observed y. So what's, what's interesting here is that essentially what it means is that in order to estimate the distribution of the potential outcome, we can just look at the distribution of observed y condition on observed x and observed treatment. And that essentially means that we can, we can estimate the distribution of potential outcome by just learning these conditional distributions from observational data. All right, and, so, and again, going back to our exercise example, we can, we can learn a model for potential outcome of blood pressure as a function of BMI and exercise. And then we can, we can look at the difference of these potential outcomes for each individual and take average over, over the population. So <clears throat> a quick note here, what, what we have been doing on this simple example of blood pressure is, is estimating population average treatment effect, and what's called PATE. So quite naturally, one, one could imagine that we could also estimate these causal effects on, on subgroups of patients or population. For example, there might be a, a subgroup of patients who have different causal effects, different treatment effects than the rest of the population. Then we can, if there is a way to characterize that population with some covariates, we can also compute conditional average treatment effect only for that subpopulation. <coughs> so, so now let's move to the sequential case where we have repeated observations from some variables. And importantly, there's also treatments that is assigned, being assigned sequentially. So can we use the same assumptions to, to estimate potential outcomes in this case as well? So the challenge here is that the, the relation between interventions and operations could become very complicated here, and they could become interleaved. As an example, for example, we can see that interventions could affect the next observations. And then those next observations could, in turn, affect the next treatments. So you could see that there could be challenging scenarios where there are complicated dependencies over time. And this is also called time-varying confounding. So we just need to be careful about this when we look at these conditional distributions. So again, we are going to use SWIGs to check the no-unmeasured confounders here. Again, we are seeing one example graph where we have done node splitting on two treatments, treatment nodes, A1 and A2. 
And again, we, are, we can see that for each, each outcome variable, when we condition on previous outcomes, it is de-separated from the previous, from the observed treatments. So that, that again, would, means that we did the third assumption, the non measured confounder hold. And so we can use the same tricks that we used before to, to, to write the distribution of potential outcomes in terms of things that we observe in the, in the observational data. So once we have these potential outcomes, what's interesting is that we can use them to, to do randomized controlled trials. So let's imagine that the, the process that was used to generate the data that we observe is, is shown here, is, is Q. There's a distribution to generate the covariates, condition on covariates, treatments were somehow assigned, and then condition on treatment and covariates, the, the outcome were, were determined. Now let's imagine that we want to run this experiment, run an experiment where we, wa we want to assign treatments to individuals based on some other strategy, where we call, for example, here p of x, px of a. <coughs> so what we can do on the first line, we, we, we showed in the previous slides that this conditional distribution of y given a and x is basically the same as, as the distribution of potential outcome condition on covariates. So we can change that distribution there. And then to, do, to, to run another experiment where we, where we choose to, to assign treatments based on a distribution that we would like, we could, all we need to do is to just change that distribution of treatment assignment, which was p of observed a given x in the, in the observational data, to any other distribution for assigning treatments that we would like. And that would essentially gives us a way to, to to run an experiment with any treatment assignment strategy that, that we want. There are many examples of using potential outcomes for, for estimating causal inference. One, for estimating causal effects. One example case here is, is, is this paper by Taubman et al, where they're using the same strategy for, for running a simulation trial to simulate population with different, with different interventions and then use that, those simulations to, to estimate the effect of the risk of coronary heart disease under different interventions. For example, under the, if, if someone quits smoking or if someone maintains BMI less than 25 or so on. <coughs> All right, so th there's this other paper is also interesting by, by Brotherson and et al. They are looking to estimate the effect of single discrete time intervention on a time series, on a sequential data. The, the assumption here is that we have a target time series Y, and we, we get to observe this time series, and you can see it, this is the black line here in the figure. And at some point, the, some interventions begin, begin on, this, on this time series. We also have some surrogate time series, some other time series, X1 and X2, which, are, which we are going to use, which they're using to predict Y, the target time series. And now the, the point is that there is no intervention on these other time series x1 and x2. So, so they're, they're using x1 and x2 as a surrogate to, to estimate the counterfactual of y under no treatment. That is to estimate that what, what the time series would have looked like after the intervention begins if, we, if there was no intervention. <coughs> There are also many other examples, some of them you're seeing here, which in the interest of time, we're not going to talk about the details of these papers. So before, now before going to the next section, we are going to quickly talk about some of the challenges of fitting clinical data, working with clinical data, and we're going to briefly talk about Gaussian processes. So, <coughs> The challenge in working with clinical data is typically that this kind of data is very messy. So here you can see one example signal for 25 individuals. And you can see that there is, there is a big difference in, in terms of frequency of observations and in terms of the rate at which this signal is, is measured across the different individuals. So what it means is that there is no natural discrete time step that we could take and discretize this data or be in this data. The same thing is true if you look at different signals for one individual. You can see here that there are some, exam some signals like heart rate that are much more frequently sampled than compared to, for example, lactate or creatinine. 
And again, this these all show that we, we can't simply choose a simple discrete time step and discretize the data. So instead, what we are going to do is to, to take this data as a consider this treat this data as a continuous time process and use Gaussian processes to model this data. All right, so we are going to do a quick review of Gaussian processes, just a few, few slides. GPs are flexible priors over functions, which can handle sparse and irregular sample data in a very natural way. So we define a Gaussian process as a collection of random variables, any finite number of which have a joint Gaussian distribution. So we can fully specify a Gaussian process by just defining a mean and a covariance function, which is sometimes also called the kernel function. You can see here three sample draws from a Gaussian process with mean 0 and a squared exponential kernel. Once we observe some, some data, we can also compute the posterior of Gaussian process condition on those observations. For example, at any given time t star, we can compute what the value of function we can compute the distribution of the, on the value of that function at that time, condition on the observations. So by, by definition, the, the distribution of this value of function at any given time and observed data is jointly Gaussian. So in order to compute the posterior, all we need to do is to compute the joint distribution of observed data and the value of function at any other point, and then take the conditional distribution of f star given given observed data. And that is done use, based, based using simple properties of multivariate normal distribution. And again, in this, in this figure, we are, we are seeing we have three or four observations. We computed the posterior. And again, we are showing three sample draws from the posterior of this Gaussian process. All right, so how can we fit a Gaussian process when we have observed data? So let's imagine we have n pairs of input-output points from an individual's EHR signal. The <clears throat> this observation is, for, for each given time, we have a value of the signal, which is y. So y, we're assuming, is, is generated from a Gaussian process plus an additive noise term. For the noise term, we are, we are usually assuming that that noise term has a Gaussian distribution. We have to still specify what the mean and kernel function for this GP is. So for the mean function, we are usually assuming that the mean function is set to fixed to 0. And for the kernel, there are, there are numerous examples, we can, numerous choices we can take. One common example is, is the squared exponential kernel, which you're going to see here. This is parameterized by, a, by one parameter L, which is called length scale. And that sort of controls how the correlation or covariance between points at t and t prime changes as the, or decreases as the distance between these two points increase. So once we specify our Gaussian process, we, in order to estimate these parameters, the length of scale of, this, of the kernel and also the variance of the noise, one common way to do this is to compute the marginal likelihood. So we compute this marginal likelihood by integrating out the, the GP process, the, the latent function f, which has a GP prior on it. So in, in this case, because, because we made this choice that the, 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 the noise is also has a normal distribution, the marginal likelihood is also a Gaussian distribution, so which we can, we can very easily maximize to, to, to estimate L and sigma squared. OK, so there are many different examples of using GPs to fit EHR signals on, or clinical data in general. <clears throat> we are showing some examples here. You can see that these signals could be very complicated. They could have very challenging structure. Some signals could be very sparse. Some others could be more frequently sampled. And GPs could generally fit, fit very well to this kind of data. <clears throat> All right, so Suchi is going to come back and talk about using these Gaussian processes and potential outcome framework that we set up and she's going to talk about using these frameworks to do counterfactual reasoning on, on clinical data. So Hussein just talked to you about potential outcome, the potential outcome framework. We're going to come back to our problem where we started of trying to figure out for this individual what is the right thing to do. And now let's imagine we wanted to figure out what is the trajectory look, going to look like under option A versus option B, treatment versus no treatment. And um, if we had to do this at 10 years, then you could imagine you know, just modeling the random variable, which is the value of this particular marker at year 10, 
condition on history. Now, in the rest of this talk, we're going to not just think about the random variable at a specific point in time, but trajectories. So for example, uh, in the example I'd given, what is this person's lung trajectory going to be um, under different treatment interventions um, given their history? Okay. So in thinking about trajectory valued outcomes, we effectively are modeling y of t, where t is over an interval. We are modeling the distribution over functions. So that's a potential. So what is the distribution over functions under they receive treatment A versus treatment B? Okay? Or a sequence of interventions um, in the future. Okay. And in thinking about this, let's go to a, a concrete example. Here what I'm showing you is creatinine. So creatinine is a lab test that's done. It's used to measure kidney function. High creatinine values are bad, low creatinine values are good. On the x-axis is not uh, time in hours, and what I'm showing you is a data from an individual of creatinine markers. Um, and blue is data in the history, orange is data in the future. X's are showing different treatments, and color of the X's show what kind of treatment. Now, the main thing I want you to get out of this plot is, um, in this example, you can see that the timing between measurements is irregular and random, much like Hussein spoke to you about earlier today. Moreover, the time between when treatments are assigned are also random. So effectively, unlike the discrete time setting, where we did not have to treat the timing of when the measurements are made and when the actions are made, here, both of those are also random choices. So the doctor looks at past measurements of creatinine, decides, ah, creatinine seems to be trending up. Maybe this person's declining. Perhaps I should give them uh, you know, a treatment. Or alternatively, they might look at past creatinine measurements you know, increasing and suggest, maybe let me do another creatinine measurement to see if the trend is going to continue or stop or change. So going back to modeling trajectory-valued potential outcomes, here in this case, we're going to be learning it from observational traces. And so here, traces are represented as with HFI. You have a collection of time points. So T of ij is for the ith individual, the jth point, right? So you're effectively collecting. Um, you may have ni such observations for them. Um, Tij are all of those distinct points at which you have data. And yij is the value of the marker data. Aij is the action that was taken, OK? And the action doesn't always have to be, the action doesn't always have to be uh, you know, at every time point, they don't always have to act. It can be a null action, and I'll describe that shortly. So here's kind of a high-level roadmap of how to proceed. So one, we're going to posit a probabilistic model over traces. Two, we are going to use maximum like to estimation to e estimate these models from data. And three, just like we did earlier in the, you know, in the discrete time setting, Hussein described the assumptions that were applicable in order to tie um, the estimated probabilistic model to the target counterfactual outcomes of interest, we're going to define assumptions here in the same way. Okay, And so now the next few slides are some of the key ideas. I know we're running short on time, so I'm going to speed up a little bit. But the next few ideas are slides, if you can pay attention and get uh, you know, the main th thrust that's effectively sort of the most important takeaways from this talk. So, now, when we're learning from traces and we want to learn these kind of actual models from traces, we want to posit a model. And we're positing a model for estimating these outcomes. We want to posit a model for both when a measurement is made or action is taken and what the values of measurement and actions are. And in order to do that, we're basically going to utilize the framework of marked point processes in order to model the sequence of events or times when measurements are made or actions are taken. And Gaussian processes in order to mark the relationship between the actual measurement values that are done. Um, the notion of MPPs and GPs has been used before by Cunningham et al. And also, um, this notion of um, moving from the discrete time setting to the continuous time setting and the need for thinking about uh, how to generalize the potential outcomes framework, and in particular, the assumptions necessary, something that others have thought about, like Locke and Arias and in their own, in other related settings. OK, so let's go back to our framework for MPPs. So a mark point process builds on the 
framework of a simple point process. What a simple point process does is a distribution over event, event times. So they can be possibly infinite infinite times. These are positive, so greater than zero, so over and, and increasing. And uh, in order to define an event process, effectively, you're defining uh, lambda star. Now, I'm using the star notation here throughout for the rest of the talk to, de uh, to denote that um, this quantity depends on history of the measurement. So the parameters there in terms of saying what the intensity process is, is going to be condition on history. Okay? And so what lambda star th there is showing you is the, um, the instantaneous probability of an event happening in this small delta t interval given history. That's effectively what lambda t, uh, lambda star, um, that's what this uh, intensity uh, parameter represents. And now the marked aspect of it is, given that an event occurs, what type of an event it is, right? So effectively, um, an event could be a null event. That means no action was taken or an action was taken. And if an action was taken, what type of an action was taken? So which type of a treatment was given, OK? So in our setting, when we're learning from observational traces, it is not the case that every single, so there are two types of events. And we're going to extend the mark space to denote these. So one, we start by looking at ZA and ZY. So ZA is the action non-null, right? At that given time when we have uh, a data point or an event, in this event, is the, was there an action taken or not? So maybe it's simply uh, an action taken means was there treatment given or not? So maybe it was simply a time point at which a measurement was made, but no specific treatment was given. Alternatively, it could be an event where an actual measurement is given. So ZY is on or off, depending on uh, it's one if an event uh, occurred where a measurement was uh, made. Okay? A is the union of all possible actions and the null event, which is no action was taken. And y is the union of all possible outcome values, continuous outcome values. Uh, it can be continuous value outcome. For instance, different values of creatinine and the null outcome, which is no measurement of creatinine was made. Okay? So the corresponding conditional density now is, um, in terms of the mark, you're putting a density on y, a, z, y, and z, a. And the way we uh, factor that is, uh, you know, y, which is the value of the creatinine marker, given that an, a measurement was made and given the history, um, that's the first term. And then the second term is, again, given history, given that, um, given history and given that there was an event, what is the probability that an action was taken and a measurement was made? That's the second term. Okay, and we're going to, and you know, you can now define each of those terms. Uh, you can define a probabilistic model for each of those uh, terms. Now, in order to learn this from data, effectively, you're going to write out the likelihood uh, for each of the terms in the observational trace and uh, use maximum likelihood estimation to estimate these. And in particular, I want to highlight a couple of terms here. So this term in the middle effectively models the event process itself, when the event times occur. This term is modeling the outcome value, in this case, the creatinine value. Given that an event has occurred, you're going to make the measurement what the value of the creatinine is given historical measurements. Now that we know how to think about, so we're treating both the values and the timing of those values as random. And we've defined a probabilistic model for it. We're going to use maximum likelihood estimation to estimate it. The question is, how do we now target, tie it back to the target counterfactual model of interest? Right? So we're going to go back and talk about the assumptions that uh, Hussein had previously spoken about for this setting. So previously, we had spoken about cons uh, consistency, positivity, and no unmeasured confounding. Now, in this setting, we have to modify some of those assumptions. In particular, consistency holds just as before. And there are two assumptions we have to, you know, that are new in this setting. So the first is the extension of the known measured confounding to the continuous time setting. The second is non-informative measured times. Okay. Let me remind you the NUC um, assumption in the discrete time setting. We had y of a independent of a, the random variable, which is the action assignment that happened in the obs observational data, given x equals little x. This occurs when the action assignment policy that was used to generate the observational data does not depend on any 
unobserved or latent variables. Um, and so in our setting, when we want to do the continuous time knock extension, instead of just the action variable itself, what the action uh, intervention assignment was, we also have to think about when the measurement themselves were made. So now the analogous scenario here is effectively talking about four such variables we have to explicitly list out. The first is t is independent of y s of a. So y s of a is the potential trajectory valued potential outcome. h of t minus is the history that's given to us. s is a time past t from, from where you're estimating the trajectory valued potential outcome. And effectively, it says y s of a is now independent of t, the timing at which measurements are being made in the observational data. Second, um, similarly, y s of a is also independent of um, a, z y, and z a. So both the choice of uh, what action was taken, whether or not the measurement was made, and when the measurement was made. Okay, so these assumptions are true when the choice of when to measure depends only on the observed data. Similarly, the choice of which actions to give or which interventions to give in the observational data depends only on the history of the patient, right? So an example, a simple example of this would be as follows. Let's imagine the creatinine scenario I had given you where doctors choosing to measure creatinine levels and their choice of when to measure is dependent entirely on data that's already visible in the electronic health record, right? Which is often the case in a hospital setting. So for instance, they see the creatinine measurements go up, and based on that, they're choosing to decide whether to take another creatinine measurement or not. Similarly, they're seeing the creatinine measurements go up, and based on that, they're deciding whether or not they want to treat, and when to treat, and how to treat, okay? This third uh, assumption is about non-informative uh, measurement times. In particular, intuitively, the way to think about this is the measured outcome at time t is an unbiased observation of the trajectory at that time. So it's not the case that effectively, you know, what you're observing has been selectively reported, okay? So to review, if the stated assumptions hold, which is of consistency, continuous time knock, as described earlier, and non-informative measurement times, then um, the estimated likely, the model can be tied back to the counterfactual model, which means what would have happened had you done x? So the estimate is effectively giving you, uh, the estimated model is giving you an estimate of the counterfactual outcome, which is had you done x, what would have happened? Now, an important caveat here is in stating these assumptions, you can actually look at data and think about, you know, are these assumptions being violated and the degree to which they are being violated, right? And very often these assumptions are being, uh, you know, you know, you'll have to go back in your domain and think hard about what assumptions are true about the data generating process in order to reason about these assumptions. Moreover, I swept under the rug that um, the estimated, uh, uh, estimated potential outcome is going to be what you would have obtained had you done this trial, but that also relies on the assumption that the um, the way you've chosen to model the potential outcome is not restricting you in ways that you can't express properties of the data generating process that are true, right? So if there are certain, uh, and actually let me get back to that in the context of concrete examples. So to review, I spoke about the a framework using MPP and MPPs, um, and here in particular today we're talking a lot about Gaussian processes and use of Gaussian processes to model the outcome Y. Uh, instead of using GPs, you can use other more flexible models uh, for modeling the outcome data. Um, but today we'll focus on using um, GPs. And now for the rest of the talk, I'm mostly going to focus on, you know, given those assumptions, you can estimate it using this framework. Now, the part that I've left unspecified is how am I going to talk about, you know, how am I going to represent P of Y given history, okay? So let's start with a very, very simple model. So here, again, going back to your data, thinking about the data generating process is useful because the outputs you'll get out of it are much more interpretable and useful. Moreover, if you're making strong assumptions that are false in the data generating process, you can't hope for your resulting estimates to be useful and correct, okay? 
So here's an example. Again, here in the, I'm showing you an example uh, with creatinine. And uh, the first graph here shows you uh, how creatinine on, on a person with chronic kidney disease, the creatinine values goes up over time. And this is a simulation, by the way. So creatinine values are going up over time. In red vertical line, what I'm showing you is a time at which I do an intervention. And the dashed red line, let me show you here on a slide. So effectively right here, the dashed red line is effectively once I give an intervention, how does the creatinine value change, right? So this is the response piece. And if you add the two up, the second graph shows you what the resulting creatinine marker values look like once, you know, left untreated, you treat, and now it causes a little change, and you can see effectively the resulting creatinine value. And now in this, you know, on the third plot, what I'm showing you is effectively instead of treating with uh, dialysis once or a treatment for creatinine once, you're treating them multiple times. And in this particular setting, I've assumed an additive treatment effect. So, you know, treatment effects add up over time. And effectively, what you're seeing is what would that trajectory looks like as you offer this treatment multiple times. Okay. On top, in order to represent this, I've spoken about two concepts. The first concept is the notion of a baseline progression model. So this is, if left untreated, how does this person progress? The second is now when you layer on treatments, how does treatment affect the trajectory, right? So in this particular case, we're talking about the outcome model as an additive model, where you have a baseline progression plus your treatment effect. And an additional assumption you can make, which I made for the simulation, is that even your treatment effect model is additive in the sense that if multiple treatments are given, the response is additive. But it doesn't have to be as such. You can have interaction effects. For the purpose of today's talk, majority of the examples I will show you rely on an additive model. And again, this is an example of a type of violation. If you don't know anything about the data generating process and you're making strong assumptions that are incorrect for the data you're modeling, then the resulting estimates of the counterfactual uh, outcome are not going to be correct either. So, in order to represent your baseline progression model and your treatment response model, you can make varying choices depending on, uh, upon the domain and the data set you have. And there are numerous other uh, pieces of work that have explored, for instance, you know, using a mixture of GPs, hierarchical GPs for treatment response. Depending on the dynamics of the particular treatment you're modeling, you might choose different classes of flexible parametric functions. And I'll show a few examples today. Okay. So let me start with an extremely simple example to now motivate this framework, contrasting it with the first example I had shown of doing classical regression, right? So in this example, I'm going to do the following. I have a patient. I have data on them for some period of time. I want to predict their outcome in, for the 12 hour in the future, OK? And I have some historical data. And I have 200 such trajectories for training, 200 such trajectories for testing. In this particular simulation example, I assume patients come from three classes. The baseline progression model comes from three classes. These classes are represented as uh, functions from a GP, where your mean is represented using uh, B-splines. And there are three types of trajectory. They have a declining mean. Second is they have a first uh, a declining mean, and then it stabilizes. And third, a stable trajectory. For the treatment effect component, we assume something um, simple, which is the treatment increases the mean function by a constant amount. In other words, improves the marker value by a constant amount uh, for the two hour period after the, when the treatment is given. And we assume an additive treatment effect. OK. So now we're going to evaluate what happens when we use the proposed framework versus the framework where we just do classical regression. So if we wanted to predict at time 12, or 12 hours in the future, what is the value of the uh, outcome? In this case, let's say the creatinine measurement is going to look like, given history. One way to do this is to treat this as a uh, you know, uh, classical regression problem using Gaussian processes. So you have, your, you, know, you have your covariance kernel, you estimate those parameters, and you're computing the conditional distribution of the marker value at hour 12, condition on the historical data that's available. OK. The second approach is using the proposed framework. Now, in your training data, now here's the critical idea. In your training data, all sorts of stuff might have been done to them from, let's imagine you had 0 to 12, 12 to 24. Okay, So 0 to 12, you're taking your training data. You have 0 to 12, 12 to 24. You're learning 
from your training data, what is the value of the trajectory at hour 24, which is 12 hours past the 12th hour mark, and you're predicting condition on history in the first 12 hours. Okay, I hope that wasn't too confusing. So now the question is, in your training data, between the hour 12 and 24, lots of other treatments have been, might have been given. But when you're doing classical regression, you're going to ignore that and we effectively answer what the average value would have looked like under, you know, in the training data. Now in the CGP framework instead, here when you're asking for this individual given history, what is the, what is the outcome at hour 24, which is 12 hours after when you're predicting, you're now asking, what is the outcome going to be under no treatment, right? So when you're asking this question of what is the outcome under no treatment, in your training data, all of those trajectories where people had received interventions, you have to discount or account for the effects of those interventions in order to compute the outcome, what it would have been had you not treated this individual, right? So the type of generalization is slightly different. In the latter, from your training data, individuals who had received treatments, you're effectively generalizing by accounting for the treatments they have received, discounting it, and then forecasting. Versus in the former approach, the classical GP uh, regression approach, you're just averaging over uh, possible treatment regimes. Okay, so now if your training and test environments were the same, the example that I started this talk with, then the RGP and CGB predictions are very similar. Effectively, the question you're asking about what would this person's average response look like at hour 24, um, here what I'm reporting is mean average error of the predictive trajectories from 12 to 16, 16 to 20, and 20 to 24 hours. And what we're seeing is basically the errors are very similar across the two frameworks. But now, as we start, so let's imagine I learned, so in this particular setting, I'm learning from data where I had lots of interventions in 0 to 12, and no interventions 12 to 24. And when I apply the RGP-CGP framework, they're going to give the same, what I'm reporting here is the average error in that setting. Now, when I instead have data where there are tons of interventions between 12 to 24, when I apply the RGP versus CGP framework, CGP appropriately discounts for treatments that were given in the training data and is able to learn something. And you can see that the CGP performance doesn't degrade versus the RGP's performance degrades. And this is again, going back to the original example, as the distribution of the um, um, prescription policy or the treatment assignment policy changes, effectively classical regression methods have a harder time. They're, you know, you can't generalize as well. Okay, so now let's go to a real example. So this is going back to my example of creatinine. I started with this motivating example of doing what if analysis, which is for this individual, tell me what will the creatinine trajectory look like had I done X versus had I done Y. Um, so here in, in, in our, we look at data from uh, real patients in the hospital setting. Uh, we use data, um, we're going to model the baseline progression and the treatment response functions, both of these were motivated by reading of the literature and um, the types of effects you tend to see for creatinine data in particular. And here in this case, we represent, um, I'm showing you the mean function, the response function. I don't expect you uh, expect to sort of describe these in detail. This is only to say that um, uh, the, the dynamics of these are selected uh, you know, while they have parameters that we learn, the dynamics are motivated by the marker themselves. In this slide, I'm going to show you now the application of the framework we just spoke about for the motivating example of doing what if analysis with real clinical data. And so here on the left side, what I'm showing you first is a patient where <coughs> they received intermittent hemodialysis. In green are all the in green are shown the points that the tool has access to in order to forecast the trajectory. In red are all the points in the future. And this person you can see green point, green crosses, those are all of the points at which hemo intermittent hemodialysis was given. And then what we're plotting for you are two, tra the, the mean, the posterior mean of two, two trajectories. One is the um, version where they actually, it's under the factual treatment, which is them getting hemodialysis at those specific points. And the other is the counterfactual, which is under no treatment. And for patient one, what it's, uh, you know, Clinically, this is 
you know, clinically this makes sense. And, you know, the only way to really know this is to actually do a real trial on this patient. But clinically what, you know, this holds up, what what's being shown here, which is you can see that under the factual treatment, it fits the data pretty well, the, the forecasted trajectory. And the counterfactual, which is if you hadn't received the hemodialysis treatment, then effectively your creatinine values would have gone up. And so, so that holds up to, um, you know, what clinically we know to be true, that hemodialysis helps. In the second example, we're now showing you an, uh, a case where this person actually happened to have not been treated uh, past the point of predict, uh, past, the, uh, past the point at which we're uh, forecasting the outcome. And I'm showing you a counterfactual here instead where we offer three or four doses of uh, hemodialysis, right? So in this patient, we're saying CVVHD is a continuous version of hemodialysis that's given. And so we show you four different uh, times at which it's given, and we show the counterfactual trajectory of what would have happened had they received um, um, hemodialysis. And again, clinically, the, what you know, this holds up in the sense that if I had given you hemodialysis, your creatinine values would have gone down and your trajectory would have improved. So what I just spoke to you about was a single example where you had a single marker, we treated treatments, the treatments or the interventions that were given as discrete, which is not quite true in all of clinical data. Many, many interventions are given, are continuous valued, um, and they're given, administered continuously over time. But, but for now, that was a simplifying assumption with a single marker and the uh, treatment assigned, the treatment that was being considered as discrete, okay? Now we're going to consider the case where you have multiple markers, so like BUN, creatinine, potassium, calcium, these are multiple markers measured on the same patient. The questions you might want to ask are, does the treatment, is there any shared structure in the effect that the treatment has across multiple markers? And you might expect to see, for instance, BUN and creatinine, which are both measures of kidney function, they might behave in related ways when you try to treat the patient. And so there are interesting exploratory analysis questions around, you know, which patients tend to be responsive, non-responsive, but also what is the shared structure across multiple signals when you assign a treatment? Here in this example, basically, you're having to see, um, you, what I'm showing you here is treatments that may be administered continuously over time. And, you know, you may change the dose level of the treatment continuously over time. And so now, going back to the same framework of the baseline progression and treatment response model, for the baseline progression, in order to capture correlation structure, one way to think about it is to, you know, one, one way to model that is using multi-output calcium processes, where effectively you have low dimensional, a small number of latent functions that capture correlation structure across multiple outputs. In this case, multiple measurement types that you're making. The second, in terms of the treatment response, in order to be able to monitor response to continuous time actions or continuous time interventions that are continuous valued, we're going to, uh, this piece of work uses the framework of linear time invariant systems. And in particular, here in this middle visualization, I'm showing you two pieces. First is the input, which is x of t. And the input here is if the treatment is uh, discrete, and discrete valued, what you're basically seeing is then input a spike. And if it's something that's administered over time, then effectively you have a curve. And the level decides the dose level, right? So these are basically functions that, that specify the input dose. Now the, the graph in the middle I effectively impulse response functions. And it's the convolution of the dose with the impulse response functions that gives you the treatment response. So the, the functions shown on the right are the uh, treatment response functions. And in order to be able to estimate the treatment response effectively, you're estimating the, you're giving the doses input and you're estimating the parameters of the impulse response functions. Um, an interesting aspect of, you know, LTI is I effectively, uh, different, this is a way of expressing, uh, you know, if there are biological systems where you have differential equations that describe what the treatment response model is, effectively you can bring those in uh, in order to model treatment response in this setting, okay? And so now, um, again, let, let me show you a simple application of this to data. 
Um, here we use uh, MIMIC2 data, again, in the inpatient setting. Uh, we're looking at uh, different types of treatments here, all related to creatinine, so same example, CRRT and IHD. Uh, instead of looking at just creatinine values itself, we have six different markers. We're looking at patients with acute kidney injury with a fair number of creatinine values, so more than 10 observations. Um, and uh, in the data set we'll analyze, we'll take 70% of the data from a patient as training and using that to forecast the uh, response to treatment. Um, now, in order to show the value of using, um, you know, a CGP-based approach versus, say, uh, a couple of other classical approaches people use, so BART, people have used BART very, um, uh, BART has shown a fair amount of success in causal inference tasks for being able to take data and estimate treatment effects. Um, however, BART is typically tra tailored for cross-sectional data, so we do a comparison with BART to illustrate the importance of not binning the data. The second, we also compare with LSTMs, which are state-of-the-art models for doing um, time series prediction. And um, in, in the cases where they're both discrete time models, what we're doing is effectively uh, binning the data, uh, training, um, training a predictor where given history we predict the next time slice, now given the predicted time slice and the history we predict the next time slice and so on and so forth. Okay? And what I'm showing you here is the uh, root mean squared error on the x-axis is prediction horizon in days, on the y-axis is the error model. And effectively, um, the proposed framework has much lower error, significantly lower error than, and you, you can see the error bars, they're very tight around uh, the uh, reported results. And basically, the re proposed model has significantly lower error compared to, say, LSTMs or or BART uh, applied to this kind of data. And again, for more details, um, you know, that I glossed over a ton of very important details in terms of how the baselines were set up and exactly how the error models were measured. But just sort of the quick takeaway here is that indeed, when we try to compare to models that do binning and discretization, um, you know, the proposed approach makes a huge difference. Furthermore, uh, when we try to compare with powerful models where we don't actually model this mechanistic structure of baseline model and treatment, regress uh, treatment response model, which, for instance, LSTMs aren't doing, um, taken as is, then, again, the proposed model makes a big difference. Qualitatively, you could take, again, the outputs of these are very exciting and interesting because you can now look at the inferred, on any given individual, you can look at the inferred baseline progression and treatment response models um, and effectively ask questions like what kind of shared structure exists and who tends to be responsive and not responsive. And now a word of caution, while we used ideas for causal inference in order to be able to estimate these, there were lots of assumptions we made about uh, the particular outcome model and more also during the estimation procedure, it's not the case that all of these functions are identifiable. So you have to kind of treat this more as an approach to doing exploratory analysis rather than make formal claims about the estimated effect. One last example, and this is using the idea to use, to estimate, um, use, uh, do Bayesian estimation of treatment response um, from electronic health record data in settings where you know there's heterogeneous treatment response. So in this particular example that I'm showing you, effectively we have individuals where we're modeling the response um, of different interventions that are given for blood pressure. These are vasopressors, beta blockers, and fluids. And um, every single plot is for a given dose. We're plotting variable, various lines, and each line here represents the posterior mean for a given individual. So the first things to gloss over here is the fact that, um, you know, um, there's a huge amount of variability across individuals. Um, and and, it's, and while in some plots, for instance, uh, the first vasopressor plot, you can see that there's some clustering going on. So there are people who tend to be non-responsive, people who are somewhat responsive, people who are not uh, responsive at all. Um, and effectively, um, so now the question might be, you know, up until now, the examples I'd given you, I hadn't, I'd assumed a treatment response model where we were estimating treatment parameters that were the same across the entire population. Now, again, going back to the same framework, now what we can do is, we're looking at the function, the parameters that describe the baseline progression model and the treatment response model. You can put hierarchical Bayesian priors that allow you to um, 
get posterior estimates on what the treatment response function might look like at the individual level. Moreover, as new data arrive, you can effectively refine your estimates. So again, another interesting tool for doing uh, exploratory analysis and allowing you to get an estimate of what this sort of trajectory would have looked like under different treatments. So to conclude, I hope in the very least, in the very first part of the talk, um, you know, for those of you who are building predictive models quite a bit using electronic health data, I've convinced you that um, you know, naive application of predictive models may lead to models that are counterintuitive and violate constru construct validity. In other words, you know, um, just like we gave you in that example where, we, where the model came up with the fact that high temperature in flu is not associated with high risk. Um, then, you know, there were natural reasons why that's happening is because we effectively, when we are training predictive models, we're not accounting for the um, interventions that are then affecting your ability to generalize. So we introduced this uh, notion of using um, counterfactual reasoning. In particular, we focused heavily on this notion of observational traces. So from that, which is what we obtained from sparsely regularly sampled uh, electronic health record data. We spoke about developing this framework with uh, this notion of uh, assumptions that were necessary to tie the potential outcome model to the estimate, to the conditional distributions we were going to estimate from data. In addition to that, uh, assumptions you might write down to write to, uh, for the potential outcome model itself. And what this means is um, the baseline progression model, the treatment response model. And really, the main takeaway is it's really important to think about hard about your data generating distribution. There's not really an easy, you know, we would all love to have a tool where you can just download the tool, take some data, press some button, out comes some answers. And it's extremely important to think hard about, in clinical data especially, it's very hard, important to think about you know, what is the data generating distribution? What are the assumptions, data generating process? What was the assumptions driving the data generating pr process? And then assuming all those assumptions are satisfied, you can sort of get some degree of comfort or you can start to reason or get some degree of comfort around to what extent the estimated counterfactual trajectories are likely to be correct. Okay, uh, many, many open challenges. Um, you know, we need uh, a more rigorous framework for knowing when to trust the model. So how do we check sensitivity to the assumptions? Some assumptions are not testable. Others might, others you can do sensitivity analysis with respect to. And so uh, coming up with a way to incorporate those ideas to evaluate, you know, you know, there isn't a notion of this is correct and not correct versus the degree to which it's correct, right? So the degree to which the estimated counterfactual trajectories are correct. Second, uh, more flexible and richer models that fully embrace the complexity of EHR data. We made a ton of assumptions. Even for the models we did describe, we made simplifying assumptions in order to make estimation possible. And we need richer models that uh, fully embrace the complexity of EHR data. Uh, fi uh, finally, I assumed uh, that the data were missing at random in the talk today. Um, and um, you know, extending it to the cases where missing not at random is very important in some settings, especially, for instance, if you're mod modeling data with uh, chronic diseases. One last one. Um, coming up with more easy ways to incorporate known mechanisms into model building. And with that, thank you. <laughs>